Welcome everybody to this live taping of Afikra's Conversations with Associate Professor of Arabic Literature, Huda Fakhreddin, who is a professor of Arabic Literature at the Middle East Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Her work focuses on modernist movements or trends in Arabic poetry and the relationship to the Arabic literary tradition. She's interested in the role of the Arabic Qasida as a space for negotiating the foreign and the indigenous, the modern and the traditional, and its relationship to the poet to other poetic forms such as the free verse poem and the prose poem. She's the author of Metapoesis, I think, is that right? Um, in the Arabic tradition, which came out in 2015, and the Arabic prose poem, Poetic Theory and Practice, which came out in 2021. Huda, welcome to Afikra. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I'm really happy uh, that you are here. It spells trouble for me when I don't know how to pronounce the first word of the book that we're about to discuss. And so I'm revealing my ignorance uh, at the very jump of the talk, but I'm excited about- It means that there's a journey ahead. That's exciting. exactly. I'm excited about that ignorance uh, to slowly um, be replaced by some sort of information. So let me, let me ask you first a little biographical stuff. Um, did you grow up reading poetry? Yes. That's the most vivid memory for me growing up is reading or listening to poetry. Yes. Yeah. What, what sort of po poetry did you love as a child? I grew up in Lebanon during the Civil War, and I don't really remember going to school regularly. I don't remember much, really. It's all a big blur. But one of the most vivid uh, memories in my mind is in the car between house and house and between the South and Beirut and my father's voice reciting to us poetry. So what kind of poetry? I grew up fascinated by the Mu'allaqat. So the seven pre-Islamic, seven or 10 pre-Islamic poems. And I memorized their openings without really understanding a single word. <laughs> they were magic to me. It was like I had a superpower. And I learned, I grew up listening to stories about Mutanabbi and the Salik, the pre-Islamic poets, Al-Ma'arri, Abu Tammam. And I always thought that these were like distant relatives that I will meet eventually. Uh, I have to say, I was disappointed when I studied them in school. It really created a conflict in me because these people were mine and I thought that they were being uh, misrepresented in the, in the curriculum. But yeah, that was the poetry I love. Mostly what we now call classical Arabic poetry. I know, I know you have a question about that. Yeah. But pre-Islamic and Abbasid mainly. And as a teenager, I read Badr Shakir Sayyab and I fell in love with his diwan. I carried it with me everywhere I go. And then as I grew up, I started reading English poetry, maybe as a as a form of rebellion, as you know, asserting my own, my own. Mm -hmm as opposed to my father's and my family's. So I also carried uh, selections of T.S. Eliot's poems with me everywhere I go. And I, yes, I memorized the openings of many of his poems. And those were my, the voices in my head. Yeah. Did some of them, did some of the poetry, um, when did it sort of uh, depart from being a sort of a musical and melodic and sort of um, auditory relationship to being something that was about meaning and about um, the actual written word? I think it, it was maybe in, in school because all of my memories of this immediate relationship with poetry as sound precede my school years and they were rela they related to the family and to home, my grandfather and my father and these spaces that were created and that were that became home to me when we really didn't have a stable home. I'm not sure if you you're probably too young to remember growing up uh, in Civil War Beirut, where things are always shifting and you never really settled. You're always on the move. So home was this that sound that was created uh, around a, an Arabic text, often a poem. Yeah. But then in school, that's where the conflict began, and you know this the struggle to to preserve my ownership over these texts as opposed to the way they're often dissected and flattened and reduced 
in curricula and in you know so it's not that um it's not that you were you felt betrayed insofar as these poems were now you felt like you needed to share them they were no longer your relatives um and they were sort of this like open source thing it's also that they were being bastardized by through the through the teaching of them yes i think so that's mm. it i i would love to share them that's how i create re created relationships those are some of my most lasting relationships that's how my i met my husband over sharing a poem uh, but it was the way they're framed to 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 appear outdated and archaic and flat whereas they are to me some of the most urgent forms of art that i've encountered in my life and i i feel that there's always uh, something worthwhile. There's so there's always a gain in going back to them, back yeah. to them, and it, in the presence of the poem. I'd never think of of great poetry as as old or past. A poem, I always say, is, is in the present moment, whether it was written a thousand years ago or yesterday. Yeah. Okay. I want to come back to this this very thing um, later on in the interview when we talk about who you're who you're writing for, um, but I. Before this, I, I, I can't betray my ignorance and I have to ask you some basic terms to, and since I have you here and help you help me understand this. What is classical Arabic poetry? What does this term mean and what does it not mean? I told you, this is a huge question and I'm gonna, you know, muster the courage to attempt an answer. Let me begin with the word classical. I have an issue with the word classical because what it means, the association that many readers or listeners will have with classical is that it's something that's outdated, something that's ancient, fossilized in a way, that's irrelevant or that you have to make relevant. And that doesn't apply to, to Arabic poetry, I think. So when we say classical, we mean poetry that was written a long time ago. And I just said there's po time in poetry is unlike time outside of poetry. So it's not a development or a pro progression or succession. So a historical approach to poetry is always reductive and, and um, um, will fail in addressing what makes poetry poetry. But we use that term to refer to pre-modern Arabic poetry, poetry written uh, before the 20th century, and more specifically, poetry written according to the rules of classical prosody in Arabic, yani meter and rhyme, a poem that has a single meter and a mono rhyme, or sometimes a variation of rhyme, is referred to as classical, as opposed to modern Arabic poetry, which liberated itself gradually from those rules. Is there, is there, what, what was before classical Arabic poetry? So we use the term to refer to a, a, a long stretch of poetry yeah. from if you there were poets writing classical Arabic poetry in, in terms of form in around in the first half of the 20th century. So if you start there and go back, you will go all the way back to the earliest poems that have that were, were preserved or have that we have. And those are pre-Islamic poems. So that's why it's a very problematic label, because, you yeah. know, it comes together hundreds, centuries of poetry in, in this very um, easily manipulated label. Yeah, when it's sort of like, that, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the assumption is that Arabic poetry for all of these centuries was one thing, unchangeable, rigid, fossilizing over time until it becomes a, this classical thing that we need to make an effort to to read or understand or connect to. And I think that is not true. So but in terms of form, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Ask no, me. no, no, no. Go ahead in terms of form, and then I'm going to ask in a question. In terms of but... form, it, it really uh, centers on meter. So we tend to call a poem classical when it follows a single meter and has mono rhyme. It's written, written according to the archetypal form, the qasida. And then we call modern poetry that that doesn't follow that as rigidly or completely liberates itself from it as does the prose poem. But even under the label modern Arabic poetry, that should be nuanced. It's not only one thing. There are many modern Arabic poems or forms of modern Arabic poetry. Yeah. Just as there are many modes of Arabic poetry that's included under the problematic label of classical. 
Yeah. So it, what I was going to say earlier, it's it's almost like in sort of uh, the Western European musical tradition, the term classical music gets thrown out as basically music, orchestral music, right? Instrument, instrument, instrumental music, but it includes in common parlance, it includes romantic music and Baroque music and classical. It can in, even include like John Cage in some cases, but it's that's clearly not um, classical by any sort of uh, rigid definition. Okay, I wanna talk about modernist because when I think of the word modernist, I always think about the 20th century and the sort of 1950s and, um, but what do you mean when you say Abbasid modernist poetry? Give us some sort of dates and uh, stylistic uh, sort of borders. So I deliberately, and maybe a, a little cautiously, used the term modernist in this first book, Metapoesis in the Arabic mm -hmm. Tradition, to describe the Abbasid poets. And I, I posit that and try to explain it in the introduction to the book, where I say that I my attempt or one of my goals in this book is to divorce modernist from history, or modernism in poetry from history, to redefine the term modernist to mean uh, a modernizing or revitalizing or experimenting or um, a trend in poetry that doesn't necessarily have to happen in the 20th century. There are examples of it before that. Poets are always looking to make it new, to make something new. And in the Abbasid age, the 9th, 10th, 11th century, there were poets who were preoccupied with the need to to make the Arabic Qasida new. Their ways of making it new are not as clearly identifiable as they might be in, in the, the 20th century where they broke the form on the page, it looks different. They were still writing Qasidas, metered and rhymed, but the revolution was on the level of rhetoric and imagery and language. And I, in this book, uh, argue that it is just as revolutionary and groundbreaking as, you know, uh, getting rid of, of rules of prosody. And that's why I insist on calling, calling them modernist or modernizing, because I think that moment, and again, going back to my initial idea of time, of history and its uh, periods and categories are not as relevant in a poetic approach when we're interested in how poetry thinks of itself and develops and how poets have conversations with each other across time. It doesn't always matter who came first. Sometimes somebody who lived in the ninth century might be more new poetically than somebody writing today. Are the, at the time, was it thought of as being groundbreaking? Yes, it was thought of as being groundbreaking and dangerous. So the Abbasid poets, people like Bashar ibn Burd, Abu Nuwas, Abu Tammam, uh, Buhturi, and we, there's always a comparison between Abu Tammam and Buhturi. Buhturi comes out as being the more moderate, the less problematic of the two, but they're both modernizers. They were described as muhdath poets. And in Arabic, the word muhdath uh, it means like some innovating something that's problematic, something that's hard to categorize, something that's menacing or unsettling. Like, like cutting edge almost. Yeah, and they were also called, their poetry was called Badia, related to bida, sedition, fitna, like something that might upset order in life, not only in language and in poetry and in the arts. This was a poetry that, that threatened to upset institutions from the institution of language and, 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 and criticism to institutions around the Quran, to institutions of politics and religion. And this is why many of these poets were attacked some of them ended up being executed horrifically, as is the case of Bashar ibn Burd, or just described as mufsidin, as, as corruptors, agitators. And that's why poetry is important, yeah, Mikey, as you asked me. I'm sorry, yes. No, that was, it was amazing timing because you were like, that's, and that's why poetry is so important, yeah, Mikey. And then you went on mute. I was like, oh, wow, such a dramatic moment. <laughs> that's silence. It was poetic. Yes. And that's okay, why so, it's important. Yes. I, yeah. So let me ask you a question. So um, what happened afterwards? So the ninth century to the 20th century, there's a lot of time. What 
did it sort of lull for a long time or was there a lack of disruption? Was there a um, sort of a step backwards, so to speak? Well, there's always, I think, as long as there are poets, there's always this need to present something new, to break through and disrupt in a positive way, to revitalize language and the world. But again, I go back to this historicist approach to the Arabic literary tradition, which highlights the Abbasid age as the golden age. And then what comes after the post-classical is often thought of in Arabic as Asr al a time of where things calmed down and became repetitive and derivative. And that's also a problematic view of this period. There are amazing scholars recently who are rediscovering this period and you know, dusting it off and showing us how much creativity and experimentation happened. But the Abbasid age rem remains a high point where much of that was happening in a, in a relatively short period of time. And poets were in conversation with each other. And that's where the meta poetry and in conversation with their critics and their detractors and their, their um, the objectors to their projects. So, so there was a lot of theorizing that accompanied the poetry in that moment. Uh, that I study in my first book. Amazing. So I want to talk a little bit about the second book, um, which is uh, entitled The Arabic Prose Poem, for those who can't see the screen. Um, and so let me ask you just a really basic question. What is free verse Arabic poetry and what is Arabic prose poetry? What do those terms have in common and what, um, in what ways are they completely different? So to start off, it's important to note that we have borrowed the term free verse and prose poetry from Western traditions, English in this case. But free verse in Arabic is very specific and particular to Arabic. It's not the same as free verse in French or free verse in English. Free verse in Arabic is relatively free. It's not entirely free. So the Qasida, which is the classical qasida, something like and it will go on like this for all the verses that, it, that sometimes 100, sometimes 50, 50 verses on the same meter with the same mono rhyme. This is the classical, the archetypal qasida. The free verse poem, which was launched supposedly according to critics who like to pin, pin, pin things down, the end of the 40s with poets like Nazik al-Malaika, Abad al-Sheikh al-Sayyab, Abdul Wahab al-Bayati, and Adonis and many others, was a loosening of the of prosody or of the rules of, of meter and rhyme in the Arabic poem, but not entirely getting rid of them. So a poem like Abad al-Sheikh al-Sayyab's Unshudat al-Matar, Aynaki Rabatan Akhil in Sa'at al-Sahar, Aw Shurfatani Rahayan An Hum al-Qamar, is no longer a meter, but it's a foot. And this is why the more accurate uh, term to call the free verse Arabic poem is Qasidat al tafayla because it replaces the foot with one, with the, it replaces the meter with one foot and considers it a unit for building the Qasida. Uh, so the poet now has relative freedom to use one foot in a line. And instead of the bait or the verse, now we have a line or 10 uh, feet or tafailat in a line. So this is the free verse Arabic poem or qasida tafaila. So there were still rules. There was, there was still some red tape and poetry does not like that. All of poetry is always seeking to break through and to transcend and transgress. And this is why it was only natural for poets to then want to break down that wall or that fence. And this is when the Arabic prose poem, uh, the, the project of the Arabic prose poem was launched very deliberately, I think, and the theory behind it was much more elaborate and coherent than the actual poetry in practice. But around 1960, we think of as when the, the first two manifestos of Qasidat al-Nathar were published in Arabic, and then poetry became this, so when a reader, this that we have on the screen, an example from Unsil Hajj. So when a reader of English or French poetry looks at this, they will call this a free, a free verse poem because on the page in English, it looks like a free verse poem. It's lineated. We tend to think of prose poetry in, in French and English, for example, as looking like prose. That's not the case in Arabic. As long as there's no tafaila consideration, it is called prose. And for a... Uh, a reader with an ear for Arabic poetry, when they listen to this, they will instantly hear the lack of meter. 
the fact that this sounds like prose. There's nothing governing it in terms of, of uh, prosody. Yeah, what was the reaction? So in 1961, um, this is sort of um, submitted. What is the reaction from the poetry reading public? And what is the, the reaction from the, the academy or from sort of the, uh, the poetry community? Again, I'm going to reduce this into one reaction, and that will be my answer, but I'm sure that there was more nuance. The reaction was, I think, what the poets who, who, who launched this project wanted, and it was shock. It was, it was to do something that would shake things up, to borrow from Adonis, who was one of the people responsible for this. So the two manifestos was, Unsil Hajj wrote an introduction to his collection that he titled Len, Yani Never or Won't, won't. And an article that uh, Adonis wrote in uh, Shad, and he titled um, Fi Qasidat al -Nathir. So the idea of the prose poem is much more tempting and convincing, I think, in my personal opinion, than the actual poetry. The poetry, especially in the beginnings of the movement, is upsetting, is annoying. It is, is frustrating. And I think that's part of the project that was intentional to say that, okay, you as a reader of Arabic poetry have, have gotten into the habit of reading poetry in a certain way, even with Qasidat al tafayla often it begins with something that looks like standing upon the ruined abodes. It does borrow motifs, it's lyrical in a familiar way. So why don't you, we shock you on every level and say this, sometimes looking like this, sometimes looking like a paragraph that does not offer you any of your expectations of poetry as a, as a reader of poetry in Arabic. And we're going to call it not only poetry. What's really triggering here, we're calling it a qasida because Arabic does not have another word for poem. So it is going to be qasida al nathr whether you like it or not, and deal with it. And people dealt with it. And that's why it became such a hot topic and a controversy. People are adamantly against it. People, yani readers, but also critics and poets. And they separate it into camps. And it becomes this very amusing thing, something that, that I thought was worth studying in this book. Yeah, it's like it's um, not to keep on uh, using music examples, but it's like it's like Bob Dylan singing, essentially, um, and be like, I'm not going to sing. Um, I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to sound very good. That's a great example. When you go to, I'm a Bob Dylan fan. Yeah, we have issues with Bob Dylan, of course. We're not going to talk about Bob Dylan, although we can. But if you go to a Bob Dylan concert, you're frustrated because there's no single song that you can sing along with. So he he delivers. And he obscures it. He obscures all the songs on purpose. He obscures and defamiliarizes. So this is similar. This is. Again, in theory, it's a it's a type of poem that's asking the po the reader to ex exert an effort that was not required of them before. You have to come to the poem. It has to puzzle you. You have to find your way out of it, or you're stuck in it. So, and I think the defamiliarizing effect is one of the the achievements of the prose poem, even if it did not produce poetry that we'll, we'll all agree is poetry. But it's yeah. this shaking things up that is one of its successes. So let me um, contrast uh, Al-Hajj and Adonis with somebody else uh, who you, you discuss in, in your chapters, um, Maghout, who you've descri described as basically not caring what you think as a reader <laughs> and as or as a critic and just I'm doing this stuff because this is the way this is the way my brain works and describe it however you want to describe it, like mm -hmm. it, don't like it. Um, aside from, uh, I guess my, my question is, was Marut an outlier in that way? Not really, because see, the slide that you have up needs to be explained. Yeah, please <laughs> explain it. These five people probably never thought of themselves as a group or a trend or a school or maybe even friends. They each thought of themselves as, uh, each one of them thought of themselves, uh, thought of himself as the owner of a project, of a poetic project that was singular and did not belong to anything. Adonis was active more than the others in, 
in, in poetic efforts and movements, he found in magazines, he worked with other poets. But if you go back to the slide, none of the, and of course, Mahmoud Darwish became a, represent, a representative, not only of a cause of, and of all of Palestine, whether he liked it or not, but also of, of a trend. So people would say something is Darwishi as opposed to Adunisi. I think those are all irrelevant and superficial labels. But the point I'd like to make is that each of them thought of it himself as an outlier and took pride in it. And to lump them all, Darwish is, is, a, is an exception here because he never wrote a prose poem. But I thought he flirted with the idea in very productive and generative way. And that's why I thought it was appropriate to study him in this book. But again, I say here and I've said elsewhere, Darwish deliberately never wrote a prose poem. Even when he, it seemed like he was, even when he published po texts that would qualify as Arabic prose poems, he would call them something else. He would call them diaries. Dar Darwish or Adonis, sorry. Darwish, Darwish. Darwish, okay. He would call them diaries or texts. Mm -hmm. he, he, for some reason, wanted to remain inside the fence of meter all of his life. So everything Mahmoud Darwish has ever written as poetry is metered. It's Qasida Tafail. Whereas the others, Adonis has experimented and want, went back and forth between Tafaila and with, between classical poetry. Some of the Adonis's work is Shar Amudi, and classical, if you would scan it. And he's also written uh, some of the foundational uh, poems in, in the prose poem project. Yeah. The others have only written, well, Salim Barakat began his early, some of his early works were in meter, but then he abandoned that and became prolific novelist and writer. See, all of them gradually moved towards kitaba, towards writing as an open space and, and where the experimentation eventually leads us to this space where let's appreciate a text based on its own terms without coming to it with a preconceived idea of what it should be or a model to fit it in. Yeah. Where is poetry? Maybe this is uh, asking you, to you know to uh, do something that you're not qualified to do but um where do you think poetry is going now i mean uh we are you know where where we are um where where does arabic poetry where do you feel the tectonic plates shifting and where are there new things emerging whether it's from uh places outside of the arab world um in the diaspora, quote unquote, the diaspora, or places in North Africa, or uh, you know, Sudan, or um, throughout the GCC, or wherever, um, where do you think Arabic may be going? Arabic poetry. I'm not qualified to answer that question. I mean, <laughs> but, I'm, but yeah. I would go for it. So, I also one of my my. Per, my my goals in the second book on the prose poem was to arrive at the present moment of poetry, not to just remain stuck studying poetry uh, until the first half of the 20th century. So the last chapter looks at a few poets, younger poets, active today. Many of them you know, came onto the scene or published their first works in the late 90s or the early 2000s. So, but where is Arabic poetry happening? I don't think it's a place. I, yeah, I'm not going to name a country or a region. It's a space, I think, where speakers of Arabic like you and me are not only speakers of Arabic. They don't only have one singular voice in their heads. They've uh, had their products of a colonial, post-colonial, neo-colonial education where they think in more than just Arabic. And that is that has to contribute and inform the poetic practice in the in in Arabic today. I'm not going to say in the Arab world. So I think uh, poets are younger poets are contending with that, with their evolving and now more dis dissociated relationship with the Arabic language, and that's informing important poetry that's worth studying. I'm not discrediting it or belittling it. I think it's important, and it's also happening in the diaspora. So Arab American poets who write in English yeah. and in Arabic or somewhere in between, uh, writers who have a relationship with Arabic but live in Europe and also have relationships with other languages. So it's this Arabic in the world today, 
is not the same as it was when we talk about the Abbasid age or the beginning of the 20th century. And I think uh, that is informing a new Arabic poetic practice that I'm interested in studying and I, I you know, make an effort to follow. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you two more questions before we do the quick Q&A. Um, you're an educator. Uh, you see young uh, students, you know, sitting across from you, whether on Zoom or in real life. Um, what do you hope that they take away from, from, your, from your work? Do you want them to be lovers of uh, Arabic poetry? Do you want them to be critics? Um, what do you hope that they take away from your work? My hope is that they learn the importance of reading a poem. Reading a poem to discover what a poem does, not piling on top of the poem cultural, social, political, ideological agendas, but to, to, to discover the value of reading a poem, a close reading, can be groundbreaking. And it can generate knowledge about history and sociology and politics and geography. But a poem is to be read as a poem first and foremost. So that poetic approach to the Arabic, lit especially the Arabic literary tradition is something that one has to make a case for. So I'm an educator, yes, but most of my, my career has been here in the United States. When you introduced me, you said I teach in the Middle East Center. But I teach in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, which has a relationship with the Center of Middle Eastern Studies. So these entities are very problematic and uh, they ha have to be navigated with caution. They have histories, dangerous histories. Uh, and when it comes to the study of literature and especially poetry, it's always an afterthought. It's always done for some other purpose. It, poetry, Arabic literature in let me speak about my experience. The American university is approached, is, is approached or highlighted for ulterior motives. We study it as a symptom of some cultural, religious, sociological um, uh, phenomenon. So that is something that I try to resist and I hope my students uh, discover the importance of reading poetry as poetry first and foremost, and allowing Ar Arabic poetry to participate in world literature as that, as art, that can then bring in and shed light on so much else. Amazing. Um, well, I think it's, uh, I guess the, the only natural question is, are you, do you think you're successful in convincing them <laughs> to do that? Well, I don't know, but I'm hopeful because I've been, I've had the privilege and the pleasure of working with amazing students, yeah. both my students and just students who are taking over uh, the field, again, quote unquote, whatever that is, the field of Arabic literary studies. And there are a few of them in our audience, AJ and Tom and Elsa, those are uh, some of the people that I look to for inspiration now and many others who are who are approaching the study of Arabic literature with uh, a fresh perspective and are breaking down some of the barriers and the imaginary wall walls that have contorted the study of Arabic literature in the West, again, quote unquote, or in the American university into uncomfortable and suspicious uh, spaces. We are I think we're graduating away from that because of this new uh, wave of inspiring and motivated young scholars. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you one final question um, before we get to the, the quick Q&A. If you were to recommend um, a, a sort of a well-rounded, um, like five books on a desert island, um, five poets or five poems or five uh, selected texts that you were to tell somebody saying, you know what, this is a really good entryway. Um, and it, if these don't make you fall in love or uh, get hooked on exploring uh, poetry written in Arabic, then maybe other stuff will, but this, this, is, my, this is my stab at it. In Arabic? Sure. But again, we have, we have translation to contend with. But if I were to choose, it's again, they're going to be personal choices. Yeah. 
the very slim slim volume that is the Mu'allaqat Zawzani's commentary, Sharh al-Zawzani, of the seven pre-Islamic poems. That's a book that I've carried with me. That was the first thing I packed when I left Lebanon to Indiana in 2005. And I also carry with me, carried with me back then Diwan Badr Sheikh of Sayyab. Sayyab is one of my favorite poets. And I, I'm always inspired by how he succeeds and how he fails. And his Diwan is not all great, but poets have ups and downs. And one of my heroes and friends is Abu Tamam. I think Abu Tamam as a poet, because he's not as translated, well, all of these poets are not as well translated as the modern poets, but Abu Tamam is a genius. I mean, it's breathtaking to be able to just follow the acrobatics that he can perform and the way he just creates. There's so much creation that happens in Abu Tamam, in single lines by Abu Tamam. So th these are three. Yeah. If, that's yeah. great. Um, okay, let's do the quick Q&A, then we're going to open up the questions from the audience. Um, the first question is, what are you reading or watching these days? What am I reading? I'm reading, I just happen to have started reading two books at the same time, by coincidence, reading them in parallel because they arrived in the mail at the same time. So the first one is Professor Samia Mehrez's book, I've been a fan and a follower of her scholarship, especially in translation studies theory, but this is a book she wrote in Arabic. It's titled Ibrahim Naji Ziyara Hamima Ta'akharat Kathira. And it's, it's a book in which she goes back to rediscover her maternal grandfather, the poet Ibrahim Naji. And in the early chapters, I was, I was you know, uh, fascinated and very intrigued by the comments that she offers about her uh, experience in school, what she calls the colonial education, where, you know, we grow up with this schizophrenic conflicted relationship with our Arabic language and our literary heritage. So this story of reclaiming and rewriting, rediscovering the narrative intrigues me and interests me very much. And in the same vein of, of reclaiming and rewriting, the other book that I happen to be reading at the same time is Professor Noor Masalha's book, Palestine Across Millennia. And this is a book where he studies the history of education, literacy, and educational revolutions in Palestine. And he strings together this rich and vibrant cultural educational history of Palestine against the false a racist narrative that portrays Palestine as this empty place where nothing was happening. And I think both of these works that I happen to be reading coincident coincidentally at the same time are important scholarship, but they're also much needed forms of, of commitment and activism in our field. And I'm very, I'm learning a lot and I'm very inspired by those. Amazing. Okay, I have to look both those up. Amazing. Um, Okay, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Okay, I have so many answers to this question. There's, <laughs> one, answer, there's one answer that I might regret sharing, but I can't but share. It has to do with, this is like a childhood fantasy of mine. As I mentioned, I grew up in Lebanon, and my closest friend was my brother, Ali, who's a year and a half younger. And during the war, it felt sometimes that we were the only two children in the world, one of our favorite games was to pretend that we were Ashamfara and Ta'abbata Sharran. These are two Salik, pre-Islamic poets. This is influenced, of course, by stories and poetry we heard, we heard from my father, but also a TV series, a Syrian TV series that we had seen. So we'd run around, climb trees, pretending that we were Salik, and I'd memorize the opening of Milamiyat al-Arab, and that Specific line, Walidunakum ahluna sidun amellasun wa arkatu zuhlulun wa arfa ujayalu. I didn't understand any of the words initially, but that was magical. It was transporting. So my first answer would be that. But the other answer that I'll commit to today, that's the official answer, based on what I've been working on recently, is Um Kulthum. So I'm working on a book on Um Kulthum. I'd love to shadow her for a day, preferably a, a Thursday, right before she goes on stage, yeah. or during one of her meetings with her poets when they're selecting and editing a qasida. Interesting. Do you have a decade that you'd love to spend with her? 
like a, a specific 40s. day in the 40s? The 40s, when she was working with Sumbati and their relationship was was on a good day. There wasn't tension between them because cool. sometimes it was. Okay, well, 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 when that book comes out, we're going to have to have you back on the series, please. But I can't um, think. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> what do you think people most misunderstand about your work? Uh, well, thinking of the, the most recent book, I'm not interested in writing surveys and literary history. So often people say, well, you've spoke, you've mentioned this poet and that, but you did not mention so-and-so. I don't think the, the point of the work I do is to present an index of all the poets or a survey or to fill in certain quotas, poet from, poets from this country, that country, women, men. I'm interested in, in reading poems and, uh, and studying what poems can do. And I've said in, the, in that book that the selection of poets I chose could, could be replaced with other poets, but I chose those ones because their work lends itself to my argument. I'm not choosing them over others. I'm not saying they are better than others. And I hope that the work is going to be a first step. It's not the end all final statement on the Arabic prose poem. It's far from that. Um, that's one thing. Okay, Some cool. That's good to clarify. Okay, lastly, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? I'm sure there's a long list, but if you would like to highlight one person. Yeah, I, I don't have single answers for you. Many, many people. Uh, I've always been inspired by the work of, I've lived with poets whom I admire, my father and my partner, Ahmed mm -hmm. Gilman. So their toying with language always triggers and inspires me. My students always inspire me. They keep me on my toes. And I am fascinated by the way their ideas develop. But if I were to, to name one person who inspires many of us, it would have to be uh, Professor Yaroslav Stetkevich, who passed away in the summer, last summer. He's somebody that, uh, yeah, I've always been in awe of his dedication to poetry above all and to Arabic poetry and its genius, as he would say. And I learned from him that, um, that to be loyal to the Arabic poetic tradition, you have to study Bru'ul Qais as seriously as you, as you would study a poet publishing their first collection today. Uh, and so he will be greatly missed, but he will always be present the way a great poem is always present. Beautiful. Okay, we have three questions coming up. The first one is from Tito. Tito, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yes, thank you for the uh, good presentation. I'm Tito from Kenya. And... Uh, I read Arabic poetry at undergraduate in Kenya, and uh, the malakat were so fascinating. And uh, I thank you for, for 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 approving of that. And there is this conflation of qasida uh, and uh, and share qasida being used uh, as religious poetry, and share being used as as non-religious or secular poetry. Can you maybe shed light on, on, on if there is any difference between the two? Thank you. Well, not in Arabic. In Arabic, shar refers to poetry, and the qasida is the form. But I see where that comes from. In other traditions, especially in the Islamic world, where the qasida travels, it becomes associated with religious forms of poetry. Uh, but remember, originally, the Qasida predates Islam. So Qasida comes before the Quran. The language of the Quran is inspired by the language of poetry, not the other way around. But in later traditions, especially in languages like Persian or Urdu and others that borrowed the Qasida form, it became associated with Islam and with religion. But in the Arabic tradition, Qasida is the form and out of it grew other forms like the Muwashah or the shorter uh, Ghazal or the Tardiya. So we're talking strictly about um, poetic forms. The Qasida could be religious and Sha'r, poetry, in the general sense, can also be religious. So the terms are not yani, tied to these associations in Arabic. Great. Um, okay, Rumi, you're up next and uh, I'll ask you to unmute. 
Unmute. Yes. Um, hello, this is this is Rumi. Um, just a minute. Can you can you see me, Mickey? Or okay. Um, Sorry. We can hear you. Yeah, perfectly. it's okay. No, no, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Uh, so my question is to uh, our our speaker here, uh, our honored speaker. I'm actually Rumi. I'm from Bangladesh, and uh, it's I don't have much knowledge in Arabic poetry, but it's always inspired from. You know, my name Rumi was kept after by my grandfather uh, from mm -hmm. Nablana Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi. And what I find, even our national poet, which was for poet Nasrul Islam, I'm not sure if you're aware, he was the one of the first ones who tried to integrate a lot of the Arabic words into, into Sanskrit, which is the root language of, of, of Bengali. And also he brought in verses from Urdu, which was a, a, a Turkish form, you know, later on. And then, of course, from Turkic languages and everything. But what I find it very sad, or, or sad to some extent, because when I was growing up, we've been, you know, exposed to all these literature, particularly poetries from across the West, Europe, uh, the later North America, the 20th century. And what is, in a way, sad to me is that we have such close bonding going long way from the 12th century when the Sufis traveled here, even pre-Islamic, I mean, the Abbasid, there was a lot of exchanges between South Asia and Southeast Asia in terms of uh, people that traveled and the culture exposure. And then I don't know what happened over the time, at least when I was growing up. I mean, it's something like the Arabic poetry. We would love to have a poetry session. We would like to, but there is so much of that missing. And the only time we hear about it, if, if an Egyptian writer, is, his books are published through some of the publications in London or New York, and then we get to know about it, it becomes a bookseller in New York Times or something. And I find this direct exchanges should be definitely taking place. And we're not looking at always through the lenses of some other, you know, um, platforms or I mean, I just failed to express this to you because you brought in some very interesting uh, aspect or, or, you know, discussion, uh, you know. Uh, so I, I just wanted to share, is there any way we can sort of, you know, re-bring, I mean, sort of bring back this kind of connections? Because, you know, the, this, between South Asia and Southeast Asia, there's a lot of, you know, ancient cultural connections. You know, I mean, I mean Persian <laughs> literature, is what has influenced Urdu as a language, which is in Pakistan and North India. Um, the Bangla, our national poet tried, and of course he, he, you know, he didn't live very long and then he sort of, his work hit, stopped because of his sickness, but I just find it to be so fascinating. And I, I mean, I'm very honored to yeah. be in this session. I just wanted to ask your views yeah. of Rumi. how we could, yeah, sure, sure, thanks. You, you did not fail, you succeeded very well in, in in pointing to a very important problem. I mean, I use the word problem, it might not be the best word, but it's exactly that. I mean, uh, literary traditions like Arabic, Urdu, Persian, Turkish are always portrayed as emergent and marginal and they need to go through, through English or French to gain recognition or acknowledgement. And often their speakers discover them only after that detour. I will re refer you to a recent uh, conference that I co-organized with, with two amazing colleagues, Hani Rashwan and David Larson it was hosted uh, by Oxford. And it was exactly that we looked at comparative practices in the pre-modern Islamic world. So try to look at the immediate, what you call these immediate conversations and connections between these traditions that are often caged in area studies on the margin of the humanities in the uh, American or the European uh, academic institution. But they were always in conversation with each other. They never re needed the mediation of English or French or the colonizer. And they've influenced each other creatively in very amazing ways. Uh, so that's a comparative literary direction that is often marginalized because we always look westward. So thank you for bringing that up. I'm going to read our final question. And, you know, I'm just going to read it so we can go through it quickly. There is, don't you think that modern Arabic literature slash poetry is very politicized? And that is the reason why, why while teaching it, we are looking for some concrete messages in it instead of just reading just poetry. 
Does that make sense to you? Do you feel that that's true? Well, again, it goes back to us being always um, host taken hostage by our history and our history is heavy and burdensome. And that makes sense. I'm not saying that that's, uh, that approach is wrong, but poetry is always entangled and engaged with politics. Who, Abbasid poetry is highly politicized. There was engaged in, in life or death conflicts and debates. So uh, poetry definitely, poetry is its own ontology and I borrow that from someone I'm sure. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a specific special way of looking at the world. It doesn't need, need to be scaffolded by anything else, but it also necessarily informs our understanding of politics and history, geography and sociology. Yeah. We always study the Arab world uh, through the lens of all the conflicts and the wars and the upsets and the revolutions, especially in the first half of the 20th century. And that's why we study this poet because they're associated with this event or this issue. I think the approach should be the other way around. Let's read this poem and see what it tells us about this conflict and this issue. So it's just a matter of approach. I love that. Um, Huda, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to talk with us and to answer my, <laughs> my, my basic uh, complicated questions. Um, I really, really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Mikey. And thank you to all who asked amazing questions. Okay, everybody, this will come up on our podcast feed and on YouTube tomorrow. So if you know anyone who would have loved to be here but missed it, please share it. Um, and this week we have two other events. So uh, go over to afikra.com slash RSVP to see what we have coming up. Okay, everybody, good night or good day wherever you are.